All right, hope everyone is enjoying their day so far here in Chicago. Um, yeah, so again, my name is Ryan Drew, um, and we are indeed talking about KVS for much today and scalability. Um, before we get started, I do want to give a huge shout out to these folks here. Um, the project I'm going to talk about in these slides was a large group effort that we all worked on. I'm just the one who's presenting on it, uh, so I want to give recognition where it's due. Um, but just to break the ice a little bit, uh, you can find me on GitHub and on the community Slack at Learn It All. I've been a performance and scale engineer at Isovalent for just over a year and a half now, and I'm based out of Denver, Colorado. Um, and this is a picture of my cat, just for fun. Um, so let's just dig into some background information here. So I'm going to assume that we all know what Celium is, so I'm just going to talk about Cluster Mesh. Um, but Cluster Mesh essentially allows you to have intelligent cross-cluster communication. So if you have multiple clusters connected to each other, um, or multiple clusters set up in your environment that are trying to talk to each other, without cluster mesh, um, those clusters are going to view each other as external um, or world identity. When you enable cluster mesh, these clusters become aware of each other. And so you can do cool things like have a load balancer route traffic to a backend in another cluster, or do a really intelligent policy where um, a policy can reference labels that are applied to pods in a separate cluster. But one of the biggest things about Cluster Mesh is the aspect of scalability. Because Cluster Mesh allows you to scale your environment beyond single cluster um, max scale recommendations. Right, so if we look at the scale recommendations that are provided by Kubernetes, we see 150,000 total pods as well as 5,000 nodes per cluster as a maximum. But Cluster Mesh can allow you to connect up to 255 clusters. So theoretically, you could have 38 million pods and 1.2 million nodes in your environment all connected together. Um, and again, this is very theoretically, <laughs> and we'll talk about why here in a second. Um, so KV Store Mesh is a feature as a part of Cluster Mesh that's beta and 1.14. Um, and it's deployed alongside what's called the Cluster Mesh API server. And the Cluster Mesh API server is the main component deployed with Cluster Mesh that allows you to enable that cross cross-cluster functionality. Um, there is also KV Store, but this has nothing to do with KV Store Mesh. Um, so this is a little confusing, but we'll, we'll bear with it. So in this talk, we're going to cover the Cluster Mesh API server propagation latency problem. We'll talk about some testing that we did in order to explore this problem. And we'll talk about how KV Store Mesh allows for higher scale. And so our big thesis statement for the day is that KV Store Mesh allows for higher scale cluster mesh deployments by reducing the load on each cluster's cluster mesh etcd instance. Oh, and if you can tell me how many times I said the word cluster in this talk, I'll give you like a keychain. It's going to be a lot. <laughs> um, so let's get into this latency problem here. So if we look at how cluster mesh API server works under the hood, um, you know, it looks something like this. So in order for Selenium agents to be able to intelligently talk to each other across cluster, there are four resources that need to be synced across these clusters. Services, Selenium nodes, Selenium identities, and Selenium endpoints. So the agent and the operator inside of each cluster are going to modify these resources in the Kubernetes API, Kubernetes API server. And the Cluster Mesh API server is going to watch for these resources and essentially clone them into its own etcd instance. This then is going to be um, made available to remote Selenium agents and other clusters that, they, that can then pull these resources in and do that syncing. And as they get these resources, they'll plumb the data path to allow that expected connectivity. But this process raises a key question, because this state propagation has to occur in order for your connectivity to be enabled. So what happens before that? Before that, you're not going to get that connectivity. So for instance, if you have a remote client pod trying to connect to a database in another cluster, that traffic is going to be thrown right in the trash by the data path, because it's not going to recognize that workload. Um, so two key questions we wanted to explore with this was, how long does it take for this propagation to occur? And can this propagation ever fail at a high enough scale? Um, so let's get into how we looked into this. So we created this workflow for testing where we were focusing on the number of nodes in the mesh as our primary variable. So we created 255 clusters and meshed them all together. And then we created a continuous workload that consisted of two parts. The first one was a no-op workload, which is essentially 10 pods per cluster. This was to get some identities and some endpoints working in the Cluster Mesh API server. And then we deployed some benchmark tooling, which I'll talk about here on the next slide, um, in order to add load on the Cluster Mesh API server. Additionally, um, so as these are running, we just slowly increase the number of nodes and in increments until we got to 50,000. 
So the ping test was the benchmark that we wrote for this. Um, and the goal was to sort of try to create a propagation latency heuristic that we could look at throughout our test in order to observe how the mesh behaved as the number of nodes increased. And it all centers around this ping server here. Um, so the ping server in cluster B is going to start by creating a Selenium network policy that allows traffic to it on ingress with a new random label. And this label is generated, um, again, randomly on every iteration of this test, and that's really important. Um, then the ping server is going to create what's called the ping client inside of cluster A by just contacting the API server directly. And the goal of this ping client is to ping the ping server um, as fast as it possibly can on startup. But during this process, right, there's a kubelet in cluster A that's going to pick up the request for this ping client and then pass a CNI ad event onto the Selenium agent, which again is Selenium's primary responsibility as a CNI plugin. Um, we have a CNI listener pod running in cluster A that tails the logs inside of the Selenium agent in order to get an estimate of how long the CNI ad duration took, because we currently don't have a metric to expose this right now. Um, and then this CNI ad duration is sent to the ping server so it can be exposed and recorded. So during this process, we're recording three things. Right, we're recording the CNI ad duration, but the ping server is also going to record the time that it sent a request to create the ping client, and it's going to record the time that it received a ping from the ping client for the first time. And by subtracting these two from each other, we can get a heuristic of how long the propagation um, took in order to get the ping client information over to cluster B so the data path could be plumbed properly. Um, and now, there's a lot that happens during this time period because this duration records how long it took to send the request to create the ping client over the network, how long it took the API server and cluster A to process that request, all these kinds of things. In bold are the things that Selenium is directly responsible and what we were really interested in. But at the same time, if any of these things increase, it's something that's important and what we want to look at. Um, so the heuristic, although it isn't super detailed, it did give us a good jumping off point to really get into things. So we also measured a couple of other things just to help us understand what was going on, uh, such as CPU and memory usage. There were a couple of CLM agent metrics that we really focused on in terms of policy. Um, but we also focused on cluster mesh API server metrics related to etcd. So let's talk about the test environment. This is one of my favorite parts of this project. Um, because we could have created 255 clusters in the cloud and scaled them all up so we had 50,000 nodes in total. But trying to do that in the cloud would be really difficult. Uh, it'd be like trying to buy tickets to a Taylor Swift concert. It's just, it's just not going to happen. Um, so we had to come up with a creative way to reduce the amount of resources that it would take to run this test. And we ended up with this sort of architecture per cluster. So each cluster consisted of two nodes, a control plane node and a worker node. The control plane node would run the custom API server. And the worker node was responsible for running uh, what we called hollow nodes. And that consisted of two parts. Um, it was KubeMark and CDMark. So KubeMark, if you're not familiar, allows you to run what's called a hollow kubelet, where you have a kubelet that's running, but all of the lower level implementation details are hollowed out. So the kubelet will talk to the API server as if it's starting containers and mounting volumes, but it actually won't perform those actions. And that allows you to run 10 kubelets or hollow kubelets, excuse me, for every one CPU core on your node, which was great scalability for us. Um, but because this kubelet can't run Selenium agents, we also needed a tool to mock the load that Selenium is going to put on the API server and the custom API servers. So we developed a tool called Selenium to do this. Um, and that's going to apply that load so that way we're actually testing something. Um, now, in order to run our ping test benchmark that we talked about earlier, we had two special clusters in the mesh that we deemed specific to running these benchmarks. Um, these differ in two ways. So first, they deploy Prometheus in order to gather metrics, but they also have a higher uh, worker node size because we didn't want resource restrictions to limit uh, the benchmark in any way, especially since we're adding Prometheus on top. And the reason why we only ran the ping test benchmark among two clusters rather than all the clusters is because we're assuming that every cluster in the mesh has a similar view and experience inside of the mesh. And so we didn't think there would be much value in testing this between every single cluster. Just two, and so that gave us uh, another optimization as well. Um, if we draw the connections between these two clusters that are running the tests, we can see these are kind of like the communication paths. In green is the benchmark uh, communication paths. In blue is Selimok talking to its own API server to simulate the load that the agent would put on. 
and in red and yellow are the connections that are made cross-clustered each cluster mesh API server. If we add an additional cluster, ooh, there we go. If we add an additional cluster, these are the new connections that are made between each cluster mesh API server. Specifically, three new connections are added um, because we have three new nodes that are talking to the, new, the cluster mesh API servers in cluster one and two. And so now each cluster mesh API server is supporting connections from six different clients. And that's just with adding three more nodes. So things kind of scale up pretty quick here. So let's get into the results. So these are the number of nodes that we had over time during our test. We got to just above 50,000. That was how the math worked out for scaling this up. Um, and I won't make you squint. Uh, this took about three hours. Um, our CNI ad duration wasn't too interesting. You know, it had some spikes here and there. Well, not here and there, pretty much everywhere. Um, but it uh, had a slow linear trend uh, of increasing, but it felt pretty normal. So we just kind of moved on. Um, this was the same for policy implementation delay and regeneration time. So if you don't know, policy implementation delay measures the amount of time that it takes for a Selenium network policy to be plumbed into the data path after it's first received from a Selenium agent or to a Selenium agent, excuse me. Um, Policy regeneration time measures the amount of time that Selenium takes in order to do its recalculation um, of all the policies on the node. And so again, these look pretty normal, so we just kind of moved on. The interesting part is the heuristic here, which had a, a lot of really interesting spikes. Um, the y-axis here is logarithmic in scale. So we had a, a range of one millisecond to 30 seconds. Um, and we tried to correlate these to churn inside of the cluster mesh. So this bottom graph shows the rate that we're adding nodes to the mesh. And there's a rough correlation between these spikes um, and the spikes in the heuristic here. But one really interesting part was that this plateau didn't have that correlating spike. And so we were really curious what was going on there. Um, and it turns out we just had a complete failure of our benchmark at 45,000 nodes. For some reason, it just stopped working for a couple of minutes um, and that led to that weird plateau. And trying to figure out what was going on, we traced it back to the cluster mesh API server etcd. So these two graphs show the resource usage of etcd. The bottom graph shows CPU, and the top graph shows the watches for etcd over time. The green line shows the cluster mesh API server um, that was running alongside the ping client and was responsible for propagating the Selenium identity and Selenium endpoint of that ping client to the other cluster in order to enable that connectivity. The yellow line represents the cluster mesh API server that was running in a baseline cluster that didn't have to go through this additional load. Um, and you can see that at around where we see the benchmark you know, dropping, we get to around 50 cores of CPU usage uh, on etcd in that loaded cluster mesh API server. And at the same time, um, the number of watches on etcd drops by half. And so we're assuming that some CPU saturation led to these dropped watches, and one of those watches was critical for our benchmark that caused it to fail. Um, and so correlating the, C, uh, the CPU usage to our heuristic those line up pretty well. So revisiting our problem questions from earlier, right? How long does it take for this propagation to occur? Well, again, it's just for our heuristic. So calling this the propagation for a cluster mesh API server isn't too accurate. But again, one millisecond, 30 seconds. And I think the key thing here to take away is that this range is pretty high. Um, and yes, this propagation can fail um, if etcd becomes impacted critically. So how does KV Store Mesh address these? So again, KV Store Mesh allows for higher scale cluster mesh deployments by reducing that load on etcd. So if we look at the consumer model for the cluster mesh API server, every Selenium agent inside of the mesh has to connect to every other cluster mesh API server in order to do this sync. KV Store Mesh um, deploys a binary alongside of the cluster mesh API server that syncs information from other clusters into the cluster's cluster mesh API server and then Agents running inside of that cluster connect to its own cluster mesh API server instead to sync that information. So we're adding this intermediary cache here. And if we look at the number of clients that are supported for every cluster mesh API server between these two implementations, you can see the difference in scalability pretty clearly. Because the cluster mesh API server um, without KV Store has to support the number of clients that are equivalent to the number of nodes in the mesh. Whereas the KV Store Mesh um, implementation supports, you know, number of clusters in the mesh minus one as clients outside of the cluster, and the number of nodes per cluster um, as clients coming from inside the cluster. 
And using numbers from our, our test from earlier, I rounded up the number of nodes to a clean 200. Um, you can see that in the Cosmos API server case, each one was supporting you know, 50K clients. Whereas with the KV store mesh, we would only be supporting about 454. Um, so key takeaways here. If there's anything to take away from this, uh, this is what it'll be, right? So KV store mesh allows you to reduce the overall etcd CPU resource usage um, as well as memory by spreading the load that it has to take on proportionally throughout the mesh. So every cluster is now responsible for the number of, cluster, the number of nodes inside of its own cluster rather than really being responsible for handling load from the entire mesh. And this allows you to increase greater scale, but it also reduces the mesh-wide impact from churn that is caused from a single cluster because we get some isolation. So again, in the cluster mesh API server case, let's say that cluster A is scheduled for a rolling upgrade. Right, of, of Selenium, and we have Selenium agents that are restarting. As these Selenium agents restart, they're going to do list calls to the Cluster Mesh API server to do an initial sync, which is going to add that increased load, and that could impact availability for Cluster B. In the KV Store Mesh case, those agents would instead contact their own Cluster Mesh API server, um, and so Cluster B would remain unaffected because we have this, this isolation in place. Uh, in the worst case scenario, if the cluster mesh API server in cluster A restarts, that's only one client that's doing a reconnect to every other cluster mesh API server, which is a lot more manageable. And that's it. So thank you very much. Um, yeah, any questions? Oh, and please feel free to fill out the survey if you have feedback. It would be super helpful. Cool. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first one, uh, would you not recommend uh, running KV Store Mesh? Like, uh, if I run cl Cluster Mesh, why, why would I not run KV Store Mesh? I mean, is there a reason why you would not want to do that by default? So that's a good question. Um, I'd say right now, probably because it's beta. Um, that's, that'd be the main thing. The other thing is that KV Store Mesh, you're going to see the greatest results with the higher scale. If you're running in lower scale situations, um, you might actually see increased load um, from KV Store Mesh. Yeah, okay. And the uh, second one, uh, do you have any idea if it can work uh, if I use the identity allocation on KV Store? So I run at CDs that form the cluster mesh. I don't have the cluster mesh API server at all. So that's a good question. Um, if you're using KV Store mode, you could um, use a similar implementation with KV Store Mesh. Uh -huh. I just don't think we support it right now, but it should theoretically be possible. Yeah, yeah, we are thinking about Oh, cool. It, yeah. okay. okay. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any thoughts on how to protect a uh, lot of write activity from one cluster? And how do you protect the rest of the clusters from being impacted? Like a shared fate kind of thing? Yeah, so um, with KV Store Mesh, I think that's the best way to do that in a cluster mesh scenario. Is if you have a single cluster that is going to put high churn in your mesh, which typically happens, right? Because we have maybe like two clusters outside of the mesh that are having the most amount of churn and are going to put the most amount of load on other cluster mesh API servers. When you have KV Store Mesh enabled, that um, extra load is only applied to the cluster mesh API server inside its own cluster rather than throughout the entire mesh. Um, and so that, that's, that would be what I would recommend. 